Good afternoon, everyone. This is Reyes Ramirez with Fresh Arts. I am the Programs Outreach Coordinator. Um, if you haven't been here before, well, Fresh Arts is a nonprofit arts organization based primarily out of Houston, Texas. We provide resources such as knowledge sharing, professional development, um, and uh, support for creatives here in Houston. Uh, but I say primarily based in Houston because through our online uh, programming, such as the one you're watching right now, we've been able to have a farther reach. Um, and so if you haven't been here before, welcome. If you have, welcome back. Uh, this video in particular has been a series, uh, is it culminate, it is the culmination of a series of conversation regarding equity in the arts. Um, and so in the past we've, uh, discussed, um, arts writing, uh, by art writers of color, uh, discussions on language justice in the arts. And we've had a discussion on programs that center, uh, artists facing marginalization. And so this hopefully adds to that conversation in a well and meaningful way, but also understand that it's barely scratching the surface of what is happening in the arts community, of how we can address a lot of these long-standing issues that, uh, to be honest and frank, have been even at the inception of the way we conceive of art in America. And so I hope that today's conversation will, again, bring more nuance and hopefully bring some form of conversations that we can move forward with. Um, if you haven't seen our videos before, you're more than welcome to go to our archive, which is hosted on our art resource library. Um, you can, there you can revisit all of our videos, including our professional development videos uh, and other conversations in the Cultivating Equity in the Arts series. Uh, so check that out, just go to fresharts.org. And there you go. Thank you, Angela. So check those out if you haven't. Um, and also on that note, this is the last uh, installment of that series of cultivating equity in the arts. Is this the last time we'll revisit, we'll visit this topic? No, absolutely not. But I think just for July, this is gonna be the last of it um, until we kind of regroup and then continue forward because what's happening next on our schedule is a really big, big event called the Fresh Arts Summit. So if you haven't heard of that, please go to our website, learn some more. Uh, we'll drop some links obviously in the comments um, and I'll revisit this a little bit later to remind you at the end of the video, but that is the next big thing we're working on, and that'll be August 7th and 8th. Uh, feel, please register. If we have a really great sliding scale uh, registration fee where you can pay from zero to $50 to attend, and we're curating a series of professional development workshops and panels um, that really will hopefully address how artists and creatives are navigating COVID-19. There you go. So with all that in mind, that out of the way, again, we'll revisit a lot of this information at the end of the video. I have the privilege and honor of, of inter introducing our two guests today that will engage in this conversation. Uh, we have Cherry Steinwender with the Center for the Healing of Racism. And we have Sebastian Bonsi with the Houston BIPOC Artist Accountability Coalition. Hi, you two. Hello, Reyes. Hello, everybody. Sebastian. Hello. Hi, Cherry. Am I unmuted? All right. You are. You are. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start with some questions. As always, I, the first couple of questions are to set up some context uh, in case that people don't know, you know who you are or what your effort, efforts are. This hopefully gives some context and some backdrop. Um, so let's go ahead and ask this question to Cherry first. Um, can you give an overview of the Center for the Healing of Racism and uh, what you what services or what things you typically do or provide? Thank you so much, Riz, for having me on. The Center for the Healing of Racism is an, our nonprofit organization started 31 years ago. That's before y'all were born. This organization was formed to give people a platform, an arena to really talk about racism. And what is very interesting, we were the only organization in this city with racism in its title. And in fact, the word racism made people so uncomfortable until at times we were asked, why don't you take racism out of your name? And I always said to them, that's not an option. We are never gonna do that. Because one of the things that I recognized 
that everybody's using multiculturalism because it's a nice fluffy word. You know, it don't get people dandruff up, so to speak. But one of the things that I know, I'm not healing from multiculturalism. I'm healing from racism. But to me, when you look at, I entertain and go and enjoy arts from all cultures. I eat food from all cultures. I dance and listen to the music of all cultures. That's not what I'm hurting from. But this organization dared to use that word racism in its name. And I am saying now, and I'm saying it loud and proud, that this country just caught up with the Center for the Healing of Racism, because now they're using that word everywhere in commercials, public service announcement, within the faith base, as well as the political arena, they're using the word racism. The death of George Floyd gave them a pass to use it. So I'm saying to them, where you are right now, we've been there for 31 years. We look at racism and all of the different manifestations of racism, from internalized racism, institutionalized systemic structural racism, cultural racism, and that's part of what I'll be talking about tonight is cultural racism. What I am doing, it's really, fantastic based on the fact that we have been, this organization have worked in 30, no, I'm sorry, 45 states already, two countries, and we've been all over Texas, North, South, East, and West. And so with that said, I would like very much to hear from Sebastian. I want to know what he's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That was gorgeous. Uh, just let me repeat the question. Uh, Sebastian, can you give an overview of uh, the HBAAC um, and what you typically do? Or what it, what have you been doing? Well, we're brand new. You know, we're brand new. Uh, we are three people who have been having these conversations. Um, right now, is really just me, Julie DeVries, Megan Spall. And we've been having these conversations on... Uh, a personal level for me, but this sort of like conflict between uh, the recent uprising, the ongoing uprising, and a, the sort of like COVID lockdown sort of created this weird little space where we had time to, to sort of like think more fully about what's possible for three individuals. Um, we started seeing a lot of organizations making Black Lives Matter a support post, you know, putting out statements. And the, the statements were heartening. It was also very vague. It was nebulous. And we were kind of curious. It's like, what was the next step? It's like, what are these organizations willing to do to truly value black lives. And, 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 and along with black lives, all these other sort of like lives made marginal uh, through white supremacy. And, and I can thank people like uh, Terry for, for like, you know, pushing clarity in our language. And now we, you know, I don't even mind calling racism on the street with its house name, like white supremacy. Um, so we organize, we organize ourselves as a, a sort of like small coalition that would ask local organizations to sort of like be concerned about their uh, representation, about their efforts for inclusion, about their efforts for justice. So this is all voluntary. You know, we have. A, we have like about a, a, over a hundred others uh, and our professionals that uh, have signed, you know, to, to back us. We have uh, at present about twenty uh, local organizations that have agreed to sort of uh, disclose uh, the information. We're sending out a, a survey. So, like I said, we're just starting. This is our first action, and uh, it's. It's really been it's really a survey to find out 
sort of like for in the last three years or so, what does the, the makeup of the staff look like? What does their programming look like? Uh, and going forward, what are the intentions specifically in terms of racial justice? Um, because we can all talk a good game, but let's start, let's start talking, let's stop talking a, I would say, like dream, and let's start talking practice. You know, that's where we're at. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it really speaks a lot to what is going on in regards to when you have the Center for the Healing of Racism that started 31 years ago, and you have the HBAC that started this year. And I think it really goes to show, again, like, a consistent issue that has been plaguing uh, America and also in this kind of context, the arts community. Um, and so I think you, you both have already answered my next question, which is what prompted the creation and founding of this organization or collective. And so I guess my follow-up question to what you both provided, uh, the information you provided, I guess I'm gonna ask like in re context of the arts, I think one misconception I've always kind of seen or, or heard about the arts is that somehow the arts are more progressive or that they, you know, like are more uh, progressive than like, I guess, like corporate or like um, a lot of different efforts or facets of American life, uh, that the arts are somehow like less racist or even like more inclusive than, than other efforts in American, the American identity. Um, I suppose if y'all would answer to the question, in your experience, what has been uh, your experience in navigating the arts of like what has been uh, the norm or like what has been um, the kind of the common thread in the way that we think of the arts and how it actually contributes or it is actually an extension of what we understand white supremacy or a racism in America? Um, Cherry, if you could please answer that question. When I look at racism in the arts, for me, I, I really don't want to start right now. I want to look at the historical framework, the historical context. Every institution in this country was created by, by white people for white people. And ever since that beginning, we have been trying scratching and crawling to be accepted at the table. When we were accepted within the movie theater, say for an example, which is a big art form, we were not allowed to play ourselves. And in fact, we had to put blackface on to be considered in the entertainment world. Not only that, the Native Americans, they were plagued by white people with paint on their face, maybe a wig and some feathers they gathered from somewhere. When we were first allowed to play ourselves, even in the movie theater, as I said earlier, that we couldn't play ourselves. Then when we were allowed to make movies, to be in movies, we had to play to the stereotypes of who we are. That is not true of just African Americans. That is also true of Latin Americans. One of the first movies of a Latin person I can remember is the Cisco Kid in Pancho. The Cisco Kid was very white. Pancho was Mexican, but he was a buffoon. He had no equal footing of building with the Cisco Kid. As I look at this too, because we have not been valued as a people. So if we are not valued, anything that we produce is not as seen as valued as. When we look at the ballet, which is supposed to be this high European cultural form, but I know that I've seen the folklorical ballet and I thought it was one of the prettiest things I've ever seen, but you see, it doesn't have the same value. So if you don't have the same value, the money that's thrown at the arts is never gonna amount to what is thrown at European art, art form, and how we had to really create our own. Many of you have the opportunity to go and see 
the art show where people of Latin descent, African descent, displayed these beautiful quilts. That was a magnificent art form. But in the very beginning, when people of color were scrapping together materials, we didn't consider it an art form as much as it was something that we put over us at night to keep us warm. Art form. It is very interesting that in a very prestigious gallery, a person can walk in, take a banana and some duct tape and tape it to the wall and call that art. And then it's sold for billions of dollars because the person that created it or had the gumption to do it didn't look like us in this room. When I look at art and I look at the racism within the art, until we can come together in this country on equal footing, we will never be able to be fully represented in our lives and have the money to be able to do it. When I am in many arenas that to me cost billions of dollars to put together, I often think, and I use these words to myself, you see, yes, they had the money to tell their story. We don't have the money to fully tell our stories. The other thing too, that makes this difficult for us, there's a lack of curators in museums that look like us. And until we can define what art really is, that is really accepted by mainstream, we are just painting on the wall and our work will be seen by very few. And with that said, I will look at storytelling as an art form. When we are allowed to tell our own stories rather than having other people tell our stories. So it all boils down to the definition that I love using for individual racism. And that is an emotional commitment to ignorance. There are people that's holding on with all of their emotions to their ignorance. And the same is true when you look at the arts, the emotional commitment that some art is much more valuable than other art. And then it ends with, don't bother me with the facts. You see, I've made up my mind. See, I'm the one that can tell you what art is and yours is not. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Sebastian, same question. Do you need to rephrase the question, or? Uh, for, I, I got lost in that a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind yeah. uh, rephrasing, you know, just giving me a like a short version real quick. Yeah. Uh, so in your experience, or rather, I should say, in my experience, I think people have tended to see the arts as more progressive or as more kind of like inclusive or uh, more open to these kind of quote unquote like developments of progressive ideals in society but uh, I think the kind of like the way I will say for myself experience that has not always been the case and kind of can you maybe speak to like what is that how perhaps the arts um, reflect or are part or an extension of the American conscious of racism okay so and, and again like you know Talking to to Megan or Julie, you might you might have a, a different answer because they were you know born and bred here. I moved here as an adult. I was nineteen, so I've been in Texas for twenty four years. Um, and really, it feels like the Warriors out there. You all remember the Warriors, uh, Walter Hill, seventy eight, seventy nine. Um, it feels like the Warriors out there, as in it's it's a lot of turf battles. You know, it's a lot of like weird gang co colors and it's not a whole lot of mixing. Um, trying to make it out to, what was it? Was it like uh, Staten Island? It's dangerous as fuck. Violence is what we're talking about here. I've been, the way that I've seen it apply is always unexpected. You know, but I've been in education uh, for a long time. I got my uh, BFA and my MFA in Texas uh, in uh, Houston and, and Denton, respectively. I teach at a variety of uh, uh, schools. 
and to sort of like negation of student experience and expertise and professor experience and expertise that I've seen uh, talking about like students and professors of color, um, especially uh, black ones. It's it's sort of a sort of it, it's a sort of gang violence, you know, and it's it's played off like some sort of like I guess intellectual game, but um, that's been that's been the most depressing part of evolving through the youth and art scene over the years, and and I don't want to like I, I'm not I'm of the youth and art scene. Uh, we're concentrating on the youth and art scene right here. I don't think it's something special when I speak to friends, um, you know, in other cities and other states, it, their experiences are very similar. Um, but it can be hard being a student. I've seen people sort of like uh, doubting the validity of their experiences. I've seen people like reduced to tears. Um, again, in, in in this liberal art world that doesn't see itself sort of um, doing, say, the sort of violence that we're talking with, that we're seeing, say, from like, you know, we don't have like an art world ice, but if you go into a museum and you look a certain way, you know what I'm saying? The girls will shadow you in a way that's very uncomfortable, in a way that's very insulting. You know, when you see yourself and your experience mentioned in the didactics, a lot of times it's very, it's very surprising and shocking how your humanity is questioned. Um, so, you know, th 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 there's a lot of great people out there. there. There's a lot of organizations doing good work. But at the end of the day, every day in the Houston art world feels like that sort of like long trek in the Warriors going from uh, Cyrus's murder to like the safety of home without even a sort of like guarantee of safety anywhere. It's uh, it's exhausting out there. Thank you. Yeah, I will say, I think you bring up like in a really great point about how it's part of a larger like structure, right? Where it's like, yes, you have the galleries, you have the, the movie theaters, you have all these ways of which the arts are presented to the public, but in the, the background, right, of the curators, and then also what feeds into that, the students, the, uh, the educational programs. I will say I have a, a Bachelor of Arts and an MFA, and I will say I did a, a writing thesis. I, I'm a writer. I did a writing thesis for both, and on both of my committees, it was all white because that's what that's all they had. And so, um, you know, it it is kind of like a structure of like what feeds into each other. Um, and it's yeah. And so, thank you, thank you both. Um, and kind of going deeper into what your what each of your collective efforts do, um, Cherry, I'll ask you this first. Uh, could you give an example or an, I or an idea of a specific program or effort you provide uh, as part of the Center for the Healing of Racism? I'm sorry, you're still muted, Cherry. The Center for the Healing of Racism, as I said, is 31 years old. And we created an organization very intentionally to be able to talk about racism. And what is very interesting to me, even now, up until the murder of George Floyd, most people don't really have a clear understanding of what racism is and how could they? You know, it's very interesting. Earlier this month, I happened to see a news uh, feed on television and it was about this young girl, Kennedy Mitchum. And Kennedy challenged Merriam Webster Dictionary about the definition of racism. And she said there was something missing about that definition. And you see, Kennedy didn't back down. She kept at it until finally Merriam Webster Dictionary said that they will be changing the definition of racism in that dictionary in order to include the institutional systemic part of what racism really is. Now here you have a dictionary that's older than black pepper. People have been reading this definition, which is not adequate to understanding what racism is. 
And even today, most people think, well, you see, I'm okay. I've never called anyone a bad name, regardless of what bad name is used with different ethnic groups. You know, I never spit on anybody, and I use that very, very, very real, because this actually happened to have an adult spit on a child that was black, just walking home from school. You know, I've never barred anyone from coming into any place. So, so you know, I'm really okay. But what they miss is the main p picture that institution racism is an institution. It's an institution that was created for the benefits of some and to lock everybody else out. And so you use the word white supremacy. The institution of racism is really a white supremacist organization. And so all of these little bitty things that I named, no, they're not little bitty. This is the way that people use their power within the institution. So if you miss that, if you don't understand the power to be able to use all of the prejudice that you have about people of color and make laws to keep them out. It's very interesting. When I went to the uh, newly renovated Holocaust Museum and watched the video, and in that video, it said, the Nazis created 400 plus laws to keep Jewish people out. Now, I don't know if anyone have you know, really looked at the laws that have been created to keep people of Latin descent as well as people of African descent out of anything at all. So you have this history that a lot of people don't really understand. So what we were able to do in creating dialogue racism is to just dissect that word, take it apart, look at the many ways it shows up in everyday life. And that's how we came up with white privilege and unaware racism. We came up with internalized racism. And this is one that for me, I always knew there was something going on. However, I did not have a name for it. But I knew growing up in Louisiana that I was less than in the black community because I was darker than a lot of the other children that was born with Negro and colored on their birth certificate. But some way or another, they learned within the black community to have lighter skin made you better. They internalized those messages that was given to them by white people. And I love it when Malcolm X said, we weren't trained by white people to hate ourselves from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. And all those messages that we received about who we are, our less than somebodiness, we internalized it and we acted out in the only arena that's safe for us. We acted out on each other. Even Maya Angelou, she wrote a poem about the urban warrior, the urban warrior that can find no face more despicable than his own, no target greater than his, like, his own black self. You see, this is part of art. So you see, when you look at and start talking about racism, we talk about all of the forms, cultural racism, institutionalized racism, environmental racism, and of course, stereotypes, which is the glue that keep all of this racism together. Because for us, the three of us, we are not seen as individuals in this country. We are seen as members of a group. And if one of us go out and do anything negative, it reflects upon the whole group. And the way it comes out, well, you know what Black people do, and you know Black people, and you know Latin people. And you see, because we, we are not individuals in this country. So how do you create something to bring people together that look totally different from you and have these conversations? And I feel that this is one of the greatest gifts that this country got. And I hope that someday this country will realize that what we were doing was creating a way to really understand each other and to break that division of separation, you know, and to go back to what Martin Luther King said, we hate each other and we fear each other because we don't know each other. 
with we have been separated from each other. And we look to people that does not have our best interests in, at heart. Even the educational system does not have our best interests at heart. And we look to them to tell us what to do, how to do it, and how to see the world. And then lastly, I want to also call attention to how oppression have created art. The oppression that we face in this country, out of that oppression came music, paintings, just all types of cultural expression out of our own oppression in this country. But what was damaging and so hurtful to us is that out of that violence that was exercised upon us, white people made postcards of us as alligator bait. We were often depicted as very little animals. And these postcards were circulated widely across the United States. So even out of that, what we've gone through, we also have that. And last, that art form, the lynching museum, to call attention to the 4,000 plus black people lynched in this country. And then with in two or three years ago, to have the African American Museum and then the Native American Museum, where we have the chance to tell our own story and not depend on other people to do it for us. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate that. And I think kind of I, in one of the workshops that I've seen that you've done, I think a really in incredible question you ask is, do you really want to discuss racism? And, and I think that's always been kind of the crux of these conversations. Like, do, well, do you actually want to talk about it? Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your brevity and in, in kind of imposing those sorts of things and those questions and those scenarios and really getting at the heart of the matter. Uh, Sebastian, um, this question for you. So you y'all are doing, uh, and just for full disclosure, I've signed on to kind of support this letter and this survey, uh, but could you discuss the survey and how y'all kind of came to, to this conclusion that the survey was the best way to kind of come at this issue? And like, can you give a background to the survey? What are some questions and why you felt that was like the best way to kind of address this? Well, we started considering leverage, right? Um, there were some interesting letters coming out of other cities where they were asking for very radical things, interesting things. Uh, but the question that we kept coming up with in, in our conversation was like, what was your leverage in a year when the museum did none of that? Was your leverage in six months where another galleries, uh, where the galleries just presented like you didn't exist? So basically uh, the survey involves partnership you know i you ain't storming no doors to get this information this information is volunteer every organization that uh signs up volunteers to give this information freely uh and the idea is that these things can be made public and these things can be compared and these things can be tracked throughout the years then we can start having real talk um, because we all have anecdotes, man, <laughs> do we have anecdotes? But in terms of talking about what, where change needs to happen, who's, who are the leaders of positive change? Um, what are the areas that need the most attention right now? It's, we'll just be pulling a bunch of stuff, you know, out of thin air if we didn't have actual data. So we invited the organizations to gather up the information and to make it public, which is what we're, you know, that's what we're working towards right now. And uh, that information being public, after that, we can talk about, well, what sort of values do we want to rally around as a community? Uh, you know, so, 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 so that was the main idea. So the questions involved asking uh, these uh, organizations, basically, who is, uh, who makes up their staff, you know, in terms of like race, um, a mostly, but we're, we're also uh, very much interested in a sort of like, 
wider issues of representation, uh, of course. Uh, a, we are asking them who are they showing? How often are they showing them? You know, uh, it, it's just a question, it's a question of percentage. And there's no set expectation. There's no like, I would say, we're not grading people. You know, I mean, hell, I, 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 I'm, I'm a teacher and I don't like to grade people in that context. <laughs> we just wanna see what's going on and what needs to be addressed specifically. Um, so like a lot of things are still up in the air in terms of what's the next step. We know for sure there are other surveys forthcoming. You know, we've started discussing and working on other surveys that, that are and like other specific surveys in terms of their experiences in the Houston art world. And we've even started talking about uh, a survey for com commercial galleries, which were not included in this first round. So it really just is a question of collecting as much information as possible and making it sort of easily accessible to the maximum number of people. And then we can start having these discussions, then we can start having these actions together. Then we can start making these decisions about you know, what matters to us. And we can do it all out in the open. You know, that's uh that's that's the direction where this is headed right now. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, I think one thing I really appreciate of this effort is I've worked with with and for many, many arts organizations and that's always been the thing. It's they always say the word, and Cherry, you said this like multiculturalism. They'll throw out word diversity. They'll throw out a, a lot of these, you know, words that will connote good things. But in the practice of these things, that's another story. And so I think I really, I, I really appreciate this effort of, you know, maybe you'll look at a, a museum and they'll report that, oh, it, we're, yes, we're very diverse. We featured three artists of color this year out of fifteen. Uh, but we, our staff is only composed of like one person of color. Uh, and we also rely on that person to do the outreach to all the, you know, the different racial and ethnic groups. And so I think there is, I, and so I appreciate that effort that goes into that. Um, so kind of in line with that, the next question is, well, what has been the response to these efforts? I think, Cherry, you mentioned earlier that, yeah, like this, whenever you say racism or you say certain words, it, it very much triggers that emotional reliance to ignorance. Uh, and so like, what has been the response to your efforts to uh, to the Center for the Healing of Racism? First and foremost, let me say to you that I know human beings will get their money, their time, and their efforts to anything they truly believe in. It was very, very, very hard to number one, get funding from for nonprofits with racism in their name. And in fact, when you Google and try to find such foundations, you would often come up with, they don't have nothing for you. When Obama was elected into office, I had the greatest hope that now is the time. Now is the time. We will be able to have people just stumbling over trying to get to us. And that didn't happen. In fact, three months after Obama was elected to the presidency, Eric Holder said, we are a nation of cowards because we refuse to talk about race. And so, the response have not been to the level of where it is right now. And right now, it's like we're trying as hard as we can to keep up with demand and everything else. Because now, as I said earlier, it's our time. We've been using that word racism. I am really, really convinced if we would have changed our name, we probably would have found all kinds of organizations that would give money to us. But the fact that we dare to use racism and then we were not gonna back down. We were never gonna change the name. And in fact, I often attend the white privilege conference, which is held 
all over the United States, different states each year. This year, I was unable to go because they had to cancel it due to COVID. But the person that started this organization was an African-American male. And the newspaper dared to write an article that they're having a conference called the White Privilege Conference. And I think they should not change their name. And I'll never forget, and this was probably in Memphis, Tennessee, probably in 1997, when he stood up and addressed the conference, he said, that is not an option. I'm never changing the name. So what has been the response? It's been really good because we have really found, and this is the whole 31 years, we've found many people that wanted to have this conversation. And when you want to have this conversation, where do you go? You know, you Google racism in Houston, Texas. That's no organization with racism in their name. And the other part that I think is really interesting for me is that we have been able to keep going. we have able to address hundreds of thousands of people. And that's been the response because we've always been able to find people that wanted to have these conversations. Right after O.J. Simpson mar uh, <laughs> murdered his wife and got off, many people came to the dialogue that night. And some of them actually said that their employers told them not to talk about it. So if you, don't, if you wanna talk about this, if you wanna process this, if you wanna make sense of it, where are you gonna go? So that night we had an overwhelming amount of people because they wanted to process this, understand what they just saw. And now this is what's happening. Ever since George Floyd, life was so brutally taken away from him. We have so many people tell our programs open to the public. We've had to hold three times, each program three times, because it's the overwhelming amount of people that's replying. And it's not good to have over 100 people on a Zoom thing if you want them to have a chance to have a voice. So that's what has been happening. And my life, I've almost sacrificed my life for 31 years because I truly believe that we are not doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past, but we need correct information, not this fluffy stuff that we have been given as I said earlier, about institutions that don't give a hoot about either one of us on this feed and that have put some of the worst stuff out there and they call it education. And even within the last textbooks to call people of Latin descent, you know, all of these negative things for children to read. And that's what they're going to take out of those books. And that's what they're going to put out into the world. And that's how it's going to affect your life. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're kind of. I, I I like that you're kind of emphasizing right the use of this word racism, and I and I think kind of another aspect that makes people uncomfortable is, you know, who is the onus of racism on? And I think kind of like we say those things, but it, I think once you look at it, it's like, oh, who's responsible for this thing? Uh, and I think you and I think um, thank you for bringing up really a lot of amazing points on that. Uh, Sebastian, can you speak to again kind of the response? What has the response been to your to the efforts at the HBAAC? So far, so good. Uh, it's we've we've had a we've had a lot of support from individuals in the community uh, in terms of you know signing the letter, but also uh, encouraging feedback, you know, kind words. Uh, we've also had like uh, important critical feedback uh, that's sort of like help us like course correct as as we go forward. Um, you know, uh, some people said like this initiative is not really for them. Uh, that that's not where they they are sort of like I would say that's not where their efforts for change are leading them. So, and, and, you know, that's fine too. Um, it's like it's like the maximum number of sort of like initiatives and approaches and ideas that we have, the better. So, you know, we're very encouraging 
of uh, of like other approaches that are, are, are just now taking shape uh, for for similar ends. Um, and like the organizations themselves have been so far, you know, they've been on board. They've been they a lot of them signed up quick. Even the big ones, you know, we've had like some, uh, you know, very, we've had some good uh, convos with some people uh, calling in or emailing in asking for more information before they signed up. Um, so, so far, so good. It, it's not everybody. It's not going to be everybody. Uh, hopefully it's growing, you know, and, and you, that's the key thing. This is about the people. The second the people are like, forget this, then you know, we are we're willing to like pump the brakes and see what else is out there. Um that's our that's our sort of like gauge of what we're doing because we're not doing this for just the three of us. Obviously, I mean we're part of these sort of like communities that have been made marginal um over the centuries, but uh we want to make sure that our perspective remains useful and beneficial to sort of like the wider sphere of like artists and art goers and our professionals in the city. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why I signed on to support that letter and also that survey is because, um, yeah, like I've seen a lot of organizations of the arts and museums and galleries really kind of be like, uh, you know, they'll say things, they'll post things on social media, and then, you know, but when they're kind of, when you actually ask them, well, who's on your staff, or, well, who's on your board, uh, you know, that's, that story becomes quite different, and so I'm glad you're kind of, you're focusing on that story as well. I think there is kind of that performance that happens in the public, and then that, what happens behind the closed doors, and so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that work. And I'm glad that the response has been good so so far. So I can't wait. Can you uh, answer as to maybe like a timeline, like when a result or like anything like that would be made available? We are a, we sent out the first survey to, like I said, about 20 or so organizations. Um, they're of varied sizes you know some of these organizations are like tiny we're just talking about like two three people running like something versus some of these organizations have like hundreds of employees so we've given them um about six weeks to 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 answer the questions and uh we're like uh, currently building the website uh, right now it's just a, a landing page uh and, and you'll I can go all to it. It's hbaac.org. Um, but uh, yeah, so like uh, another six weeks or so before the information starts coming in, and once we once we can sort of like put it together, we'll make it available on the website. Um, then we're even talking to other people about uh, sort of helping with that uh with just that amount of data coming in uh especially since again like i'm talking this is just the first of several surveys um the next step for us behind the scene is crafting those next couple of surveys uh so as that information starts coming in we should be we should start sending out new surveys and get the next round of information you know um and uh hopefully again well hopefully uh again like the idea is that that opens up dialogue so as long as this is actually working as uh conceptualized then we're just going to keep pushing forward if if we we have like certain unforeseen roadblocks or anything else like i said we're very small we can maneuver and come to a dead stop without too many people just like you know falling off the edge or anything like that. So yeah, one step at a time, but that, that that's where we're headed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for answering that. I think I kind of want to just comment and say that, you know, I, I'm, it's amazing that, you know, three independent artists came together to do this effort, but I just want to kind of add to that and say that I think 
arts organizations should already be doing this work. And I think it's always disheartening, but also empowering to see that again, artists of color taking on that onus to make sure that those con those promises, that those things that they're saying are held uh, to standard and they are you know held to make sure that they are reality. And so again, it's it's both empowering, a little disheartening, but empowering as well to see that you guys are doing that work. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, and this is again, call to arts organizations, step up, <laughs> you know, you said it, live up to it. And so make that effort as easy as you can for these for this great team. Um, so we're running out near the end of the conversation. I mean, again, I wish we had way more time, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, could you, starting with Cherry, could you maybe give some recommendations or like uh, some ideas of other organizations or programs or resources that you think are really great and useful? Sorry, you're still muted. There's a lot of organizations that's doing incredible work. But if you really want to understand the ins and outs of racism, I invite you to visit us on our website where there's a lot of resources. And that website is www.centerhealingracism.org all lowercase, no spaces. But what I want to end with is I am really waiting to see the art that will come out of the death of George Floyd. I am sure from movies to artists with canvases, I'm looking at, I love the project that the center I'm sorry, that the city offers where these are electrical power things that they can be used as canvas for people to tell their stories and to paint all these beautiful murals. So I'm waiting now to see the art that will come out, the music, the movies, the paintings, everything that's going to come out of the time we are living in now. How will the art world tell the story? Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, same question. Do you have any or know of any other organizations or programs, perhaps some that you look to or anything that are, again, good things or resources to look at as well? Uh, and, and again, I, I'm answering this like really for Sebastian instead of like all of HBAC uh, because like uh, your mileage will vary with these things. And it's it's something that I cannot answer directly and easily, um, mostly because there are a lot of people doing tremendous work out there. You know, just looking, one of the things that I'm proud about, just if, if you look at, at the list of others that have signed up um, on the HVAC main page, like some of those names, I'm just so honored that they've backed us because these are people that I've known individually have done like amazing freaking things uh for their fellow elders for 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 the scene in houston in general um but in terms of an organization it's been a lot trickier because no i don't know of one that has a, an untarnished history and and again like this whole sort of like game mentality like i've known some organizations that have been really good for like this marginalized group but then ignored or been just like, or, or even in some cases been antagonistic towards another marginalized group. Um, so uh, unfortunately I, I don't have a straight answer, but, uh, but there's no lack, I think of individuals as independent individuals and within those organizations year in year out doing amazing work that we do see and appreciate. Um, as far as naming names, I, I don't know, we'd be here all day. We'd be here all day. But but like those those that have signed up uh, for, that have like backed the initiative that, that we know, it's like we, we want you to know how honored we are that some of you see value in what we're trying to do. 
because you, well, a lot of you have been an inspiration to the three of us over the years, definitely. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, yeah, uh, so out of respect for time, we're gonna close out the conversation, but before we do, I just wanna give y'all a moment to give any shout outs, any digital things, or anything you just wanna say to round out the conversation to have the final word on in this context. So, uh, Cherry, please, any shout outs, anything you wanna say before we go? I wanna shout out to the people within the community, the Asian descent, Asian Americans, people, because of what they have faced because of no fault of their own due to this coronavirus, where over 2,000 hate crimes, whether they were verbally or physical, have been exercised upon them. And my hope is, with the closing of the consulate, that they had nothing to do with, that no additional violence will take place. And that will be another art piece that we will be looking at in the future of all of the art that was produced because of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Cherry. Sebastian, any final shout outs, things you want to direct people to, anything? Well, you know, I, I appreciate uh, finally meeting you two, you know, uh, we sort of work remotely, Reyes, once, and I've heard really good things, Cherry, about you and your organization. Uh, so that's been great. Uh, a, a shout out to really the, the, the BIPOC people within the organizations doing the work um, in some very difficult situations. Like, uh, you, you know, like I said, I got, I got my, my BFA and my MFA in Texas, and there were very, very, very few BIPOC teachers. My first teacher of color in, in an art program is somebody that white students try to get fired right away, like the first year they got hired. And just knowing the sort of stuff that they face within their organization to, to be able to thrive and also support BIPOC students, uh, BIPOC uh, audience members, you know, and even future BIPOC employees. Um, it's, it's rough out there for them. So, so shout out for all those people who so, sort of like putting themselves in those situations and doing the hard work, the, the unjustly hard work of sort of like creating these spaces, like creating end by inch by inch for the rest of us. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you for both for discussing, you know, very, very difficult issues. I know we've barely scratched the surface, but again, thank you so much for the work, the, the incredible, impressive work that you're both doing. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Stay safe. I'll see y'all later. All right. All right. All right. There you have it. Yeah. Again, always just really meaningful conversations that we need to be having. Uh, within the arts community. Um, but again, this even though this will be the end of this context of what Fresh Arts is doing in, in the month of July, this does not mean that it is the end of the conversation overall. Um, and so again, we've scratched the surface. We hope to have many more conversations regarding this topic, regarding many topics. Uh, but this concludes it for, for July. Um, we'll let you know if we do any other things. But yes, revisit our past conversations. Uh, a series and webinars on these topics and many others right there. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Just some final things to say. Again, just a reminder, uh, the, this will be the last conversation and we're going to be uh, taking a little bit of time off to focus on our Artist Summit. Uh, so please join us there. Um, we'll be having a lot of great topics and conversations and workshops whether it be intellectual property in a digital context, uh, whether it be what you should have ready for a media kit, uh, to even uh, write conversations of what self, uh, you know, self care looks like in the context of a creative practice. So please, uh, we have a sliding scale fee registration uh, registration fee where it's from zero to fifty dollars. So please uh, fit whatever you can within your budget. Uh, please attend. We just want you to join us there. And you know, again, the conversations will be great and it'll, they'll only be better if you attend. So thank you. I'll see you at the summit.